Now, I've got another one. How the idiot mainstream media was exposed by Joe Rogan. This is from Moon. Let's let's have a look. I remember them talking about them trying to make their own Joe Rogan. We need our own liberal Joe, Joe Rogan. You bunch of doofuses. 2024 will go down as the year the mainstream media outlets finally lost their grip. As the dust settled after the US election, Dude, they lost their grip a long time ago. It became clear that Trump and Vance's appearances on podcasts were instrumental to their success, which really highlighted how independent media, even just random podcasts, are now more powerful than most mainstream media outlets. And mm -hmm. after the election, it just seems the media's ratings are down in the gutter. The New York Post is reporting that its parent company, Comcast, has confirmed a massive spin off of its cable networks. The Los Angeles Times fired the entire editorial board Thursday. CNN announced mass layoffs earlier this week week and MSNBC viewership precipitously plunged following Trump's victory. Yep. And you know what? If Trump, well, actually, you know what? This is actually kind of funny, though, if you really think about it. Their ratings were at an all-time high when Trump was in office because all they ever did was bitch, moan, and complain and create like more of an echo chamber. So now that Trump has won, you think that they'd be ready to start the printing presses, so to speak, you know, just pumping out propaganda and bitch move. A month after being released, Rogan's podcast with Trump nearly has 52 million views. In comparison, it's estimated that only around 42 million people tuned in to watch the election live across 18 TV networks. This means that it's pretty likely that more people have heard Rogan's podcast than actually watched the election unfold in real time. So let's explore why so many that people was a fun are changing night. the channel and abandoning the legacy media for good. In the weeks since their defeat of the polls, both the Democratic Party and mainstream left-wing media establishments have been asking themselves one big question. Why did they lose? For something as big as the 2024 election, there's never going to be just one answer. Now, you could easily point to the late changes in candidates and the whole fiasco with Joe Biden's health problems, as lots of people already have. Or you could talk about their snubbing of Bernie Sanders and their progressive arm of the party. Then there's the fact that Kamala just ran a bad campaign. There's a million reasons. You know what I think was one of the big turning points? It was the cough 19 I, I think they pushed their hand so hard during that whole debacle. During that whole shit show, they pushed it so hard. And I think finally, people got extraordinarily suspicious and distrusting of media and government overall. I think that was a huge point. And uh, then, and then you, you see how much propaganda is peddled how much they berate you just because you have wrong think, the levels of censorship across all different types of social media platforms. I think they have encroached so much into people that eventually, it's kind of like that old term, you know, you wake the sleeping giant, even though in my opinion, that sleeping giant is still somewhat sleeping. But I would say that they, they at least encroached enough where people started like pushing back, going, get away from me. I don't want, I don't want, the, I don't want this no more. You guys lie, cheat and steal, so to speak. And you do that enough People get sick of it. And so they turn to alternative media, podcasts, people that they actually can feel more relatable to and, and go, you know what? This guy's not too bad. Compared to like, you know, a bunch of empty suits lecturing your ass all day. Like, oh, Trump's just a, he's a felon and da, 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 while you're out there suffering and you can't buy anything. But one key difference in the run-up to the election was what happened with both of the candidates' treatments of podcasts and independent media in general. For whatever reason, Kamala never appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast, or any of the more well-known shows online. Chris mm -hmm. McGarrion, writing for the Associated Press, described the podcast appearances she did as just being cookie-cutters, saying, quote, The conversations covered a lot of the same ground as previous interviews, such as Harris's plan for making it more affordable to care for the elderly and her love for Venn diagrams for explaining complicated concepts. In other words, they gave the same impression as the carefully Malish statements she made in other interviews with the mainstream media outlets. Most interviewers didn't press her on her claims, and when they did, the producers cut it down to limit the damage. Just like in a severely edited down 20 minute interview on the show 60 Minutes. Trump and Vance, <laughs> meanwhile, were much more open to unscripted long form podcasts covering a wide range of topics. In contrast to Kamala, Trump was happy to sit down for the full three hours with Rogan, and JD Vance spent two hours talking to Theo Vaughn. The Democrat Party's reaction to this discrepancy has been to wonder why they couldn't pull the same thing off. In their view, as it has been since the pandemic, Rogan is a Republican plan set on convincing his massive audience to vote for the right wing. And to be fair, there's probably some hint of truth to this, as he did actually endorse Trump in the end. But that was only on the eve of the election after it became clear he wasn't going to get a Kamala interview. In fact, see, here's the other thing, too, is that if you really 
consider the people that follow these different types of uh, parties, if you will. When you look at people like Kamala, it's like they already have the vote. The people that are going to vote for her, they're not going to change their mind. I I seriously doubt that there's a a significant neutral voter out there that's like really weighing the odds going, who do I choose? Is it Kamala or is it Trump? You pretty much already know. The people that vote for Kamala, for the most part, are the type that don't want to hear anything else other than the rhetoric that that type of campaign would spew. They're not interested. The only thing that you're going to get from them is if you say the wrong thing, now they're going to be outraged at you. When it comes to more conservative or right-leaning people, these are the ones that tend to be more observational. They want to hear what you have to say. They want to make an informed decision, so to speak. And so when you have Trump that goes out there and he's talking to these people for hours, people are listening because they want to see what's going to happen. Kamala has nothing to talk about. She's already been in office with uh, her zombie for years already. And nothing, if anything, things have just continuously gotten worse. And then they campaign about like your genitals and a woman's right to choose. Like this is, this is what you think is going to win people over. You have nothing really to talk about. And even if you did sit down and, and talk for two hours, who wants to listen to her? She's annoying. Poopa Chalupa, $10 campaign fund. Thank you, my good man. Appreciate it. God bless. Rogan had actually endorsed Bernie Sanders in previous elections and primaries. But who are you going to vote for in the primary? I think, I think I'll probably vote for Bernie. Interesting. Yeah. Because I, I, like, I think Bernie and Tulsi together would be a f- devastating combination. I really do. The Democratic Party used to have his endorsement and his vote, but they lost it when they silenced that section of the party. Of course, through the ideological lens, Rogan is just part of a greater manosphere conspiracy to indoctrinate young men and turn them into fascists. For anyone who's seen the podcast, it's kind of a ridiculous take, but it's truly a line they're actually pushing. Just listen to this. You know, what I don't like too is that how um, the term fascist is thrown around so much. And I think the irony of it is how they always try to associate fascism with uh, right wing. And, and then when you, what, who was it? Um, the guy that basically created fascism. What was his name? Like Giovanni Gentile or something like that. And, and when you really look and break these things down, it's actually more associated with the left. Fascism is. Especially when you talk about censorship power to the state, uh, all these different things. You have more associations to the left than you do with your right in modern times. So I, I just think it's funny how they immediately try to associate it with the right and then saying that if you vote for Trump that you're a fascist and all this other stuff. You see a lot, a lot of this also in Warhammer 40K where all the, the people are spurging out calling each other fascist and shit. It's just so stupid. Yeah, excuse me, who who wants to send me to the camp because you don't uh, because we don't agree? Uh-oh. You know, it's a lot of psychological projection is what they do. Clip of an MSNBC analysis pushing this exact narrative. But what they have done in their online media ecosystem uh-huh. is build a radicalization engine, literally the way militant groups do around the world, that takes people from relatively low-level annoyances with the world. Why are eggs so expensive? Why is my kid learning this new thing in American history in school that I didn't learn? And then moves them. Uh, Why is a dude in a dress reading to him? Through YouTube videos, through podcasts, moves them from that annoyance all the way, slowly, 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 to a full-blown fascist politics. It's an elaborate, multi-billion dollar infrastructure. And there is nothing like it on the pro-democracy side. We, we don't have an, inf- when, when, a, when a man is just lost and lonely and not yet radicalized, we don't have the equivalent of Joe Rogan. What's interesting about this take is- uh, Man, the amount of assumptions out there that it's just a lonely man and then he becomes radicalized. You know, if that's, a, but you, when you really think about this, it's like, how do you treat men in general? There's a reason why men and the family structure are a threat to them because it is, Men that lead rebellions. It is men that command their families. And so what do you do? You keep the man weak and you break up his home. You create things like no-fault divorce. You, you always err on the side of the woman rather than the man. You take away his masculinity. And what do you do? You isolate him and you try to destroy him or control him. And when, when there's an opportunity for him to go a different direction, you're sitting there with that surprised Pikachu face wondering what happened. 
But that's why they always try to keep men down along with that family structure. The, the bedrock for a nation is the family. And a strong family is a strong nation. Under God. Both the absurdity of it and the jealousy of it. He doesn't skip a beat in categorizing the left as the pro-democracy side, while also implying that Rogan is a key part of a plan to brainwash the next generation. Politics mm -hmm. aside, this extreme rhetoric just makes anyone who listens to a podcast like Joe's realize the mainstream media is grasping at straws. But it's this last line that's the most revealing, where he implies that the left-wing establishment needs their own version of this indoctrination pipeline and therefore needs their own Joe Rogan. While it isn't it, it's a le see this is why when they start talking about that they need their own joe rogan and shit it has nothing to do with them truly trying to win you over to their side with strong ideas it has everything to do with telling you that you need to get in line you need to shut your mouth you, be, you better stop questioning these things and you just need to accept it for what it is that's why they can't connect with people because they themselves they operate in like this inhuman way of you are just a resource, you're a wet robot, so to speak, and you just need to be reprogrammed. They don't really see you as a human. They see you as like a resource. It's crazy. And always for these same insane reasons, others across the left have also echoed the sentiment. They've identified that if Kamala had done more long form and unscripted interviews, she probably would have gotten way more votes. Of course, this isn't the reaction probably got less. the board. Where there's jealousy, there's resentment, and you don't have to search far to find that. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, ah! the global leader in men's grooming, setting a new standard in men's care. With the holidays approaching, now is the perfect time the to holidays. treat yourself or a loved one. Just because you said that, I'm not buying it. It's the ultimate grooming tool, the Chairman Pro. This one thing that I wanted to say too, let me uh, lower this just a little bit more, is the way that they also operate on this is they always take their propaganda and assume that it's true. When you assume that the narrative is true, Everything else that stems from that is going to be crooked. So it would be like saying, my viewers, you right now that's listening to me, you're all a bunch of intolerant bigots. Okay, so if that's like that stupid, the narrative that I must hold, and I assume that it's true, now all my arguments that stem from that are going to be crooked. And when they assume that it's all these like single men, what the hell? This dude's hair is going right across his eyeball and it's bugging me. But anyways... When you assume that that's true, you're going to push people away. Because I'm already assuming that you're the villain. And whenever I speak about the subject, it's always going to fall underneath that umbrella category. You're just bigots. You're intolerant. You're this, you're that. And it's like, well, of course, how could I win you over to my side when by default I've made you a villain? It's absurd. And so that's why all their talking points it has will always you fail. Need to keep your face looking and feeling its best. So use my promo code MOON for 20% off of your order, plus free shipping. And what better way to treat yourself as someone special this season? That's 20% off plus free international shipping with promo code MOON at manscaped.com. So join over 11 million worldwide who trust Manscaped and give the gift of grooming this season. ABC. Give the grift of grooming. Don't tell that to a Democrat. That might mean something else to them. Sees the View was originally created to try and live up to its own name, <laughs> to give a platform for a wide range of women's perspectives on key issues. Of course, in the decades that the show has been running, that's changed. More recently, like a lot of new shows, it's become completely unapologetic in its clear bias. Just take one of their co-host words about Joe Rogan on a recent episode of the show. In it, she makes the strange accusation that he believes in dragons to discredit him, all while bragging about how stringent their fact-checking is in comparison to online content. I think that that's why people like our show, because they know that we are checked by ABC News. But we're if, checked by everybody. Yeah, I mean, if, if we're wrong, we have, you know, the legal note here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the human legal but the, my, in my, We went from Walter Cronkite, mm -hmm. basically, to this guy, Joe Rogan, who believes in dragons. He, I checked it. He, he believes, believes in dragons. He believes huh? in dragons. Did you triple force and, that? Yes, I did. Within this accusation, you can identify both the reason they think legacy media is superior and the evidence that it isn't. While maybe a decade ago nearly everyone trusted mainstream news, those days are now long gone. It's precisely because of how biased they've become, to the point where they've abandoned the principles which made them reliable in the first place. Here we've got a clear example of taking one thing Joe Rogan said out of context and turning it into a personal attack. When did the news become biased? You realize it's like control the opposition when you have stuff like CNN versus Fox, Fox News. They're, they're all owned. They're all bought and paid for. This, it's the illusion of choice. 
I can go a lot more into that, but uh, YouTube will probably annihilate me, so I think I'll skip on that. Act to fit their own arguments. In this case, the accusation was based on earlier podcasts where Joe had discussed the fact that nearly every culture independently came up with the idea of dragons. Very unusual for the concept of something to exist for a long time with no basis in reality. You know, that's why I'm interested in dragons. Like, why is every civilization, why do they all have dragons? They mention dragons in the Bible a bunch right. of times. They don't mention dinosaurs. Well, I think because people weren't alive when dinosaurs were alive, but I bet they were alive when dragons were alive. I bet dragons were a real thing. It's such a feeble attack that both... There's a lot of debate on that one, too, as well like the Leviathan in the Bible and stuff. Sometimes people try to say that it could be a hippo. Others try to say that it was a, a more prehistoric animal that God was talking about. Uh, it goes into a lot of different, you know how it is. Fox News and Joe Rogan himself pounced on the opportunity to make fun of it. I, I had to read the thing about The View because I just thought it was funny. What's The oh, View? The only reason why I read that about me. Dragon the lover. The, the, the radio, oh, right. Joy what this Behar is. was trying to say that I believe in dragons. <laughs> Wait, what is this? I just she heard said about I it. checked it. I checked it. And then the lady goes, did you <laughs> double check it? She goes, I checked it. He believes in dragons. She should be like, Sasquatch. They live the of people. <laughs> but it also highlights just how out of touch the mainstream establishment media has become about why they've lost so many viewers. Only Fox has seen a bump in viewership, although they're the exception here. It's likely based on the functional monopoly of mainstream right-wing coverage in the wake of Trump's victory, although they've also been far more willing to work with and pay attention to independent media as well. It's why the company that owns Fox is now putting people like Piers Morgan on YouTube, as they realize that everyone's turning to social media outlets instead of mainstream old networks. And we can see why. For most other networks, it's been a terrible first month. MSNBC in particular are in a tailspin, losing an astonishing 53% of their viewership compared to October. The other networks aren't far off. Why do you think that social media, especially places like here on YouTube, are so heavily regulated and censored? It's because they are desperate to control the narrative. This is why when you look at places like Rumble, you will find that it tends to be overwhelmingly conservative and people go there because that's where they're not going to get censored. M me, here on YouTube, I've received warnings. I've had videos that have been entirely just erased with me not even being able to, to discuss it or counter the decision or anything, YouTube will just straight up delete a video and basically tell me that um, I'm spreading false information and that don't do it again. Like that warning I got lasted three months on my channel. So you can see that not only is the mainstream media failing because they want to control the narrative on both ends, right and left, but at the same time, when people do have an avenue of freedom, so to speak, to speak out and have their own voice heard, you get giant corporations like YouTube, Google overall, that try to suppress that tremendously. Look at uh, like Alex Jones. Oh, it was just a coincidence that he got banned off all platforms like in a day. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. CNN saw a 22% drop in ratings overall and a 43% And the same people that'll tell you that a man can get pregnant are the same people that are going to tell you that they try to prevent uh, false information from spreading. It's a bunch of bullshit. Drop during prime time compared to their election coverage. It clearly isn't the time for them to put their heads in the sand. So let's analyze just what went wrong and why so much of their audience are tuning out and turning to independent media instead. One benefit with the podcast space and independent journalism in general is the amount of time you have. It's a bonus that pretty much everyone can agree on because it makes a clear difference. Firstly, complicated issues can take a long time to unravel. There just isn't space to properly explore a topic in a two minute monologue or a 30 second speech. With that little time, it's guaranteed that you're going to have to cut out some important context. But with a longer conversation, you've got plenty of time to give things the consideration they deserve. And it brings us on to another benefit. How much- It's also because it feels like a real conversation. Rather than someone in a suit and a tie with a script, which feels cold and dead more natural the final product feels. In most TV shows, there's a tight schedule where every second is accounted for. Over the past few decades, we've seen political debates and discussions on network TV melted down into 30 second sound bites to fit this mold. The time pressure is so great that the best pundits are the ones who can offer the most extreme, simple version of their thoughts on an issue. Surface level engagement is king, any real depth is just out of the question. And the end result is like reading the titles of 30 different books, compared to actually just reading one good book. These discussions end up promoting 
being biased because there just isn't room to include more than one viewpoint in your average mainstream political show. When you can find the rare show that does try to do it, the debates are rarely meaningful because there isn't time to really explore two opposing views. That isn't to say that independent media can't be biased either, we're never going to escape that, but in a longer format there isn't much room to hide, and it gives audiences the time to stop and think about what they're hearing. The lack of invasive editing helps as well. Like all of these benefits, it makes the conversation and the ideas clearer. With mainstream media, you get an incredibly restrictive view of an issue with some parts chopped out because they weren't exciting enough. People have had their words completely warped by editing and audiences get misled all the time. The root yep. of all these benefits is that independent journalists and people uh -oh. who create independent media aren't indebted to outside influences in the same way as the legacy media is. Within the establishment, there's tons of pressures on journalists and pundits that influence what they say. There's the agency they work for with its own idea of what they should be saying. There's often a billionaire owner or a set of shareholders pushing the agency in a certain direction. There's yep. even the culture of the workplace and the content that they're already making which has its own sway. And it's created a world where you get ahead by following the party line, saying what you're meant to say and never rocking the boat. Meanwhile for independence, it's more like natural selection. People gain and lose popularity and influence based almost purely on whether other people want to give them their time. Both independence yeah. and the legacy media are always searching for ratings or views and this influences both kinds of content. But with legacy media, there are far more infringing influences and it really restricts the content they make and the things they say. One of the only things the legacy media has been clinging to is their prestige and their reputations. Mm -hmm. The argument is that because of the establishment surrounding it, legacy media is more trustworthy. They say they have years of reporting the truth under their belt and strong principles of journalistic integrity. You know what this reminds me of? This kind of reminds me of like how the government will declassify things and talk about like experimentations that they've done, how the CIA and stuff has uh, perhaps uh, snapped a couple of laws to say that they've broken them. Uh, and they and then they talk about like we don't do that no more you know today we're now trustworthy and all this other stuff and I'm like yeah right yeah right you think this shit just goes away you know what you do you just rename a program is all you do so if I had the uh, the the Gamza slicing program right and then you guys find out what I've been doing you're like oh that's horrible and I'm like oh oh guys. We no longer have the Gamza slicing program. We we got rid of it. It doesn't exist no more. And then I open it up to uh, the Gamza poking program. You know what I'm saying? And it's essentially the same shit. Oh, but I, I, but I, I can get up and I can testify. Yes, the Gamza slicing program has indeed been shut down. I vow it. And and I'm not and I'm not lying. It's just that I reopened the same program underneath a new name. <laughs> it's the same thing with like this legacy media bullshit where they try to act like, oh, you know, we've had, we're, like, we're prestigious. We've got years of experience and stuff. It's like, maybe, okay. And I, and I use this term loosely, maybe. 40, 50 years ago, you had uh, better reporting. But I tell you what, it's gotten significantly worse and I don't think it's going to change. I, I'm pretty sure you guys had your propaganda back then and I'm pretty sure you still got it today. Independent media, on the other hand, is therefore much less responsible and rife with misinformation because they don't have that same oversight or reputation to uphold. Now, as for Rogan's recent comments, on one level, it's just comical. The Gamza Dicing the Program, there you go. <laughs> express worries that even though he's paid to talk for a living, he's going to be silenced in the future. While this idolized picture might be true for a few organizations, it clearly isn't the case across the board. And it's especially not true for the majority of mainstream networks. They get things wrong all the time. They push misinformation when it's suits them and they warp their narrative to fit their own agenda. Just mm -hmm. take the previous example of how they responded to Joe Rogan, using their own made up misinformation to create an attack against Joe for allegedly spreading misinformation himself. The hypocrisy is insane and there's plenty of it. The same people that want to criticize Joe Rogan are the same ones that edited his face. Do you guys remember that when they were trying to say that he was taking like horse dewormer and shit and then they edited his face to make him look like he was pale and sick? These are the same people that say that he's not credible examples. It is true that some characteristics of independent media make them more vulnerable to making mistakes. If you have a three hour conversation with someone about anything, it's pretty likely that you are going to make a mistake at some point. Plus yeah. the format itself and the proliferation of independent media means that it's more likely for people to get the truth of the matter. Just think about how historians create a picture of the past. To get the most complete picture of what's going on, they look at a wide range of sources and perspectives from the time. The more they have, the clearer the picture becomes. It doesn't even really make a difference if lots of the sources are biased, as it's the range of perspectives that matters. This is how you gain a clear picture of the world. Today, 
Let me show you guys this real quick. Let me show you basically what they had done to uh, Joe Rogan, if you didn't see it. Let me show you his face. So he was making a, a video, and they were trying to say, oh, he was taking, like, horse dewormer and shit. And so they edited his video to make him look like this. <laughs> and I think, uh, isn't he suing them for it or some shit? It's, it's absurd. And these are the same people that are telling, oh, we know, we're prestigious. We've been around for a long time. Uh, you can't trust nobody but us. We're all like historians creating a picture of the present from a massive variety of different sources. Independent journalism and the internet as a whole has given people free access to so many perspectives on the world. It's opened up more options. In fact, the pressure is now on the consumer to take their information from a wide range of sources, rather than sealing themselves into their own echo chamber. What mainstream media is really mourning is their loss of the monopoly on information. Until exactly. fairly recently, they had complete control over the information that people could access about the- Exactly. You know what's really important too? The ability to call out others as well so everybody is on a public platform everybody is out there in the town square so to speak and if you start spouting off some bullshit all you're doing is giving some free content for somebody else to call you out and go uh-uh let's go look at the facts let's go look at the documents let's go look at the images let's go see what you're really saying and see if it's true or not that's very important because now you've got competition that's holding each other accountable and that's very important world outside of their own perspective rather than turning on the tv and what you get is what you get people are enjoying this freedom and abandoning legacy media in droves while it can be messy and chaotic this greater freedom of information is one of the real benefits of our modern world independent media has widened people's perspectives and it terrifies the establishment the future of media in general is clearly a much more decentralized network of different perspectives while it might leave some people and institutions behind it's already creating a better informed world that can only be a good thing I think that was a good video. Don't auto play. There we go. I think that was a really Playing good video. Goal. Hey, yeah, I, I think that that touches on a lot of uh, good things that's happening right now, and that is that the old school dinosaur media is on its way out, and it cannot stand it. It is upset, and it is lashing and thrashing, man.